Uh, so just a quick reminder, uh, if you can just mute your phone and uh, also at the end of the session, um, there is a survey that, that you can fill. Uh, if we want to give any feedback, uh, it will be really appreciated. It's our first talk uh, here at GDC, so uh, anything can be uh, interesting for us. So this is uh, Xavier Guibault, Gameplay Tech Lead on For Honor, and I am uh, Frédéric Doll, AI programmer on For Honor at Ubisoft Montreal. So the game has been released two weeks ago. Uh, and the feedback we get from the community is, is really incredible. Uh, but a few years ago, when we started working on the project, we didn't know exactly what would be the game today. And in fact, most of the time, when you work on a new IP, on a new game, you don't know what you will be released at the end. You need to iterate, you need to prototype, you need to test stuff, you need to find what it's fun and try to build around it. On the tech side, it means that you have uh, multiple needs that will emerge, and as we were able to see uh, during this conference, uh, sometimes one technology is not enough to fulfill all these needs, and you have to uh, test multiple approaches, and maybe you have multiple approaches that uh, uh, cohabit in your game. So the vision for For Honor was to create a melee fighting game. So basically, you control a character, but most importantly, you control his weapon. So you really are inside the battlefield, you are inside the combat. Uh, one important aspect is that the game uh, needed to have a competitive multiplayer aspect. Uh, the game needs to be uh, fair because it's player against players. Uh, it needs to be skill-based, responsive, reactive, and stuff like that. Also, the game, uh, we wanted to create a game where you are in a believable battlefield. It means that it's not um, a, a kind of arena of gladiators where a few fighters are fighting each other, but really, a huge battlefield with uh, the clash of armies, hundreds of NPCs that fight each other, and you are only one soldier inside this battlefield. So for the AI, we ended up creating two separated systems. One deterministic, one replicated. Why? What hap what's happened during the process? Uh, what are the needs that we needed to uh, fulfill? That's what we will try to uh, uh, show today with this talk. So we'll, in this talk, we'll uh, uh, first show a few fundamentals of the game, how we control characters, how we under, handle the online part and stuff like that. Then Xavier will talk about the deterministic AI system. I will follow with the replicated one, and we will have a few takeaways at the end of the session. So let's start with the fundamentals. Uh, in the game, we have multiple characters uh, that you have to control. First one is the hero, uh, the one with the more skills, the more abilities. Uh, it's the one that the player uh, is able to control in the game. Uh, but we have also what we could call the map feeders. Uh, so on the left, captain, uh, soldiers, archers, uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, these are the characters that uh, create the feeling of the army. Also in the campaign, we have a cute elephant and uh, huge wolves. Uh, we have horses and, and other kind of uh, characters, but uh, uh, so yeah, that's the kind of character we have to control. Uh, and to control this character, we decided to use an input-driven approach. It means that it's like controlling a gamepad. Uh, so if you have a gamepad, you just press a button and it will uh, uh, have an impact uh, or on your character. But it means also that you have indirect control on your character. You can't uh, say in the eye, for example, I want my character to go at 10 meters per second. There is no way to do that. The only thing you can do is uh, give the orientation of the, of the left stick of your gamepad and the strength of the stick, and that's all. So it means that the AI is input-driven. Uh, we use exactly the same pipeline for the player and for the AI in, in this game. Which lets you go to one of our tools. Uh, we call it Katana. Uh, basically, it's a tool uh, that the character designer used to create the characters. Uh, so it's a huge uh, state machine uh, in which all the states, the blue boxes that you can see here, are uh, define a state of the character. So it defines a gameplay um, during a, a certain duration. The duration is defined by the length of, of the clip. Uh, and they can uh, define all kinds of properties, uh, the, the movement uh, available for the character at this moment. Uh, does he have some defense? Uh, maybe he has some modifier, he has some special abilities. And they also can define all the branchings between the states. And as you can see on the bottom, they can specify some kind of conditions that allow to trigger these kind of branchings. So, uh, yeah, so that's it, sorry. <laughs> um, 
so when, what does an update loop look like in our game? It's, in fact, pretty simple. We just generate inputs from a pad. We send them into Katana. Uh, Katana updates the state of the actor. We get this into the world, and we're able to render it. If we have multiple characters, it's exactly the same. We just generate input for the other character. We send them into Katana. It updates the state of the associated actor, and we're able to, to put that in the world. So for the AI, since we use the same pipeline, it's pretty simple. Uh, the AI has to generate inputs, send them into Katana, and you know what's happened after that. But how does it work in multiplayer? I will let Xavier explain uh, this system. All right. So, hello. Uh, so, yes, our game is a multiplayer game. It works online. Uh, the players are fighting against each other. And the architecture that we chose from the beginning was to build a peer-to-peer -peer one. And the main reason was that we wanted as little latency as possible between two fighters. Between when you're fighting somebody, he's in front of you, he's in your face. We wanted it to be as fast as possible. So what we actually send between each of the peers in a session are actually in the inputs of the players. It's the only thing with very uh, rare exceptions uh, that are actually sent. And the way that it works is when a peer receives uh, those inputs uh, from the network, it's the exact same pipeline that Frédéric mentioned. We, go we get those inputs, it starts driving the new actor with Katana. But obviously, there is lag. We're not receiving those inputs immediately yet. Uh, so what we do is we have a deterministic simulation that runs on every single uh, peer of the session. What that means is that every uh, peer is responsible to keeping in sync with everybody. Uh, when we receive an input from another peer, we, uh, every peer rewinds in time, ensures, resimulates every single step to catch up, and we end up with the same conclusion. So uh, the, this deterministic simulation in the game, what uh, Frédéric showed you before, the graph, it's all our gameplay runs into that, uh, that simulation. So everything is deterministic and comes to the same, same conclusion. To illustrate a bit what that means, uh, I'm gonna give a, an example that it doesn't really happen in our game because we don't have three frames attacks in our game, but I think it, it illustrates uh, what's ha what happens. Imagine you're fighting uh, somebody over the net, he's on the other side, and you launch an attack. So at time zero, your attack is launched, and we compute the frame, you start winding up the attack, your weapon is starting to, uh, to travel. The frame continues, we get to the second, uh, the, uh, the second part of the animation, and you finally hit your opponent, you're happy, you're, uh, you're, you're trying to celebrate, and then now comes the fourth frame. Imagine at that moment that you actually receive an input from your opponent at that moment. I mentioned that the inputs are timestamped, so we see at that moment that at time zero, the opponent uh, decided to change his stance, so what that means for us in the game is that that input, it needs to be taken into account at time zero, the moment that it happened. And what we do is that we completely invalidate the state in which we were. So there, wasn't, there were never any hits, it didn't happen. And always in the same frame that were, uh, that, that were mentioned, so the fourth frame, we start resimulating every single uh, step, but now with that new information. So the information catches on, we, we re-simulate and we end up with the result. Obviously, in that case, it's, it's pretty intense, uh, but as I mentioned, we don't have uh, four frames attacks in our games. But it's really important, uh, that aspect, because it introduces a fundamental difference in our game between a frame and a simulation step. Because simulation steps happen multiple times per frame. Uh, they're, they're directly dependent about your network conditions. When you receive those inputs, what's happening? So imagine you have your big frame, do a couple of simulations, but as soon as you start having inputs that bring you really far away in time, your frame becomes way too big, the player is sad, the frame rate drops. So this, this was a really big implication for our game. Those rewinds, they happen all the time. We, we have a way of prioritizing uh, the inputs of the actor that, that's fighting in front of you, so you won't see any rewinds with him, or as least as possible, but the actors that are around him, players that are on the other side of the, of the map, they still generate those inputs that are processed uh, more slowly. So we always have up to three to four uh, resimulation steps per frame. So we, it, it's our normal operation. And we need to be able to recover and not have a, a big impact on frame rate, uh, frame rate when we have a really big resimulation. So 
In that case, for example, uh, 300 milliseconds delay, which would mean 600 milliseconds of ping, uh, it, it, it incurs uh, up to nine steps of resimulation in a single uh, frame. To be able to do this, every single object in our game has a, a history buffer. So we save the states of those actors. It's, uh, it's, a, it's in a simplified structure, optimize and compress as much as possible. And every actor uh, has a definition of that state that's then uh, copied inside a, a bigger list. And that history buffer we keep around up to five seconds for every single object. Uh, so of course, that takes a lot of memory. And, but that enables us really to, when you go back in time, to re-simulate from, from that moment. I mentioned every single object has that, and it's really the case. Uh, you get the idea. Every, every gameplay element, the explosions in the background, the guys fighting, the heroes, the small soldiers, they all use that system. It introduces also something really awesome that we did in the game uh, that uh, helped the production that you don't see, uh, that you don't really see when you play it. It's the fact that since we keep all those states and the, the, our game is deterministic, we're able to have those kind of features in our editor. Let's say you're fighting, you're testing something, our designer is working in it, and he sees a bug. And he's like, this, this, this didn't work as expected, uh, maybe there was something that was wrong. Well, we have the ability to rewind and go back directly to where, we, uh, where was the interesting moment, and we can replay. And all the inputs of the players uh, of the, the, at that moment were recorded, and we replay them. So we get to the exact same uh, conclusion than, the, than, the, than what we saw before. And all our tools can enable us to inspect what's happening. We can see what's the states of the objects. And I mentioned designers, because it's a really powerful tool for them. But even for us programmers, uh, I mean, since the code is deterministic, we can put a breakpoint in the code, and what we're going to see is the exact same values uh, happening. Awesome camera work, by the way. <laughs> so everything that's happening, it's, it's a really powerful tool. Uh, it, it was a bit of a side effect of that architecture choice, but we wanted to share a bit about it. You probably see me coming. This talk is about AI, deterministic AI. So I, the deterministic simulation is where they live, what's happening. And when we started the game, we, we, like, uh, we knew a bit in which direction we were going, but we wanted to give a believable medieval battlefield to the player. We wanted them to, be, uh, to have a sense of scale, uh, being able to fight other fierce opponents, the other players, but also to be part of something bigger. So we knew that we wanted to add a lot of factors in our world. We were not aiming to the tens of thousands of factors. Uh, I mean, we're not a shooter, so that the size of our maps was not going to be that big. But around 200 actors was basically our goal at that moment. And with the, the architecture that we showed you in the beginning, sending all those inputs over the network, we knew it was not going to cut it. It was going to take way too much bandwidth. So our solution for that, as we mentioned in the simulation, was rather than computing the, input, the, the inputs that we're sending to actors out from outside the simulation and sending them, we compute them from inside the simulation, thus the deterministic AI. What that means is that when you're playing online, every single peer is, uh, is coming to the same conclusion and controls his AI in the exact same way. Everybody is, everybody is synchronized without sending anything over the network. And that's a really big implication for us. It, was, it, 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 it met our requirements. It worked well for that. No network traffic, that's awesome. But it had a really big implication about what did that mean on, on the CPU side. Computing all those actors with those rewinds, it was going to come to a cost, so we needed to find a good solution for that. So we have multiple one of them, but the, the big ones that enabled us to do that is the first one is time slicing. Those actors, uh, they, we wanted them to fill them up so that the players had uh, an, uh, a sense of skill. They, they did not have to be as reactive as possible, so we cheated a bit. And time slicing them and basically uh, not updating them every single step of the simulation means that if we get to a frame that we need to re-simulate multiple uh, uh, simulation steps, well, those actors are only going to be updated once. So our, our update time that we came up with was around 3 hertz. So uh, of course, it's something that we tested through, through, uh, to play tests, through gameplays. It, it, uh, we, we needed to see what was the, the, the limit at which we could bring that. It, it did allow us to be extremely resilient to rewinds in that, in that case. 
The second steps are simplified physics. So this is the world that you see when you play the game. It looks pretty and all. And this is the world that the players, all the, the, collisions, uh, the, the, the collisions that the players actually interact with. The collision meshes, uh, everybody's probably aware of, uh, of those systems. But even that, it proved too much, too costly for our simple soldiers. So what we do is we extract the collision edges uh, of, of all those uh, meshes, and all of that is cached in a localized manner in the map. So the actors really only test the ground, and they test those edges, and that's all. It's a very dull life. They don't, they're not aware of, of the risk, but they don't care. They're there to die for you, so we're not too attached for them, to them. Third of all, it's awesome, but we needed a solution for navigation. And it, it came clear at the beginning that nav mesh pathfinding, and in our case, was going to be problematic. One of the reasons was that our libraries were not uh, determ de de deterministic from the, from the get-go, so it was going to cause issues. And we, was, we had concerns about the CPU cost of all of that. So our solution was to use what we call nav flows. They're basically big roads that level designers and mission designers join the maps. It looks a bit like something like that. Obviously, it limits the gameplay space of those actors. They don't go everywhere, but they, they really have a, a defined role in the game. They're fighting uh, over a, a certain piece of territory. So level designers draw those, uh, those, those nav flows. Uh, they define which direction the actor should be going, and, but they still have parameters that they can tweak uh, to tweak uh, the eye on those. So we started to have something that was interesting. We wanted to see those actors fight and have uh, some meaningful gameplay in that, in that section. And our first solution was to start with a top-down approach to controlling where every single of those actors should be going. So you can imagine the formations, the soldiers are marching together, and having a clash. But our, so our problem with that is, uh, so on For Honor, we were extremely uh, gameplay driven. Uh, it was our mantra was uh, follow the fun and uh, fail faster and follow the fun, the four Fs. And we were playing that and we were not feeling it that it was interesting. Uh, we, the, it, was, it, it started to be evident to the players that there were some higher rules that were happening that were weird sometimes with the extra exact positioning. And also, uh, we, we, still, uh, we were still having the merge issue. Uh, it's, it's a big battlefield. There is, the players kill those guys extremely, extremely fast, so we need to fill it up as, uh, as, soon as, as often as possible. And having those formations, those platoons, and merging them was, uh, was proving to be uh, a, a daunting task. I'm, I'm not saying it's not uh, solvable, but in our case, it was, causing, it was starting to be extremely costly. It was not really fun. And uh, it started to be, uh, so it was a bit of a miss. So we took a step back. And our solution, when we think about it, is really simple. It's, it's flocking. And I'm not even kidding. Our first implementations were pretty much that. They were wandering aimlessly. But the idea was to find simple rules that would govern those actors, that, would, that when they're going to, to the center of the battlefield, so that it started to make more sense to the player. The rules are simple, uh, it's easy to visualize, and the player started to see that they had an impact on each of those actors. So the complexity of those behaviors, they come from the number of rules that you start add, adding to them. By themselves, those rules are not very complicated, but it, the more you add, the more you start adding something that's, that's interesting. So, one of them, for example, was the distance between actors. Uh, when they're traveling to, to the battle, uh, the distance between themselves, we allow them to be closer, but if they fight, we ask them to spread a bit more. There's this notion centered around the player that you, uh, we have that repulsion bubble that increases and decreases based on his actions, so they start getting, being afraid of you. And all of those starting adding up, and up to one of my, yeah, so when the player fights, those, that bubble increases and decreases, and the, and the guys can, uh, the, the soldiers can move out of the way. And those rules starting adding up. So for example, this one, the Moses effect, you start moving, they move out, 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 they move out of the way. It's always very satisfying. Uh, so all those rules added, adding over and over, uh, we were like, yeah, that's perfect. The system works, let's give that to designers so that they can start tweaking those values. Well, they were not that happy. Uh, so we, we gave those systems, and what, ha what was happening, whoops, yes. So it's still working. Yeah. So what was happening is that the, <laughs> I, need, I need to find out on that. So what we wanted was really the, the end result, the battlefield that we, that in which the player was, was actually fighting. 
but we were getting to that point with very simple rules. So every time we were changing one, it could affect the other, and it's, it's that weird moment that our, we were creating emergent gameplay, but our goal was that emergent state. So it, it was finding the rules that bring to that state proved to be a, a lot of trial and error, left and right, trying to see what happened. And to quote one of the designers I had a chance to work with, that's pretty much, uh, <laughs> that's pretty much what, she, what she was saying. Like, I'm, she was scared of touching those values. It was starting to do something weird. So, uh, so our solution for that was to create presets. In the end, when we think about it, the experience of the player in those lanes and where he's fighting was very predefined. So we wanted something very compact, claustrophobic, or something more spread out, or something that we call the, the scattered one. So those systems, if we look a bit at what, uh, how it works. So we can see a bit of the debug display, uh, all, all those forces that are applied to every actor, uh, the, guy, the, the soldiers in the back that joined the battle. Everything was very systemic. Uh, it, it, it evolved well. It was giving the result that we wanted. To go back a bit to the scattered part, we all saw those movies. Uh, I mean, those two armies are crashing into each other. Then there's that big camera cut and smoke. And then everybody is mixed up left and right. There's a big uh, a bunch of battles uh, on, on each side. And every time we were trying to get to that point, well, it wasn't working. Uh, the reality is that when you think about it, uh, the first layers just start hitting each other. And then it, the, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't creating what we really wanted. So to show the kind of thinking that brought the, us to there is that the simple rule that we ended implementing that by itself is not very complicated, but that brings us to the proper result is something like that, that we can call the, the gentleman rule, which is if somebody is fighting uh, an actor, so let's say uh, we have a blue soldier that comes to the battle, and then the other blue soldier sees, oh, I'm sorry, uh, you're doing a duel, he lets him fight, and he goes to find a new target, which is more appropriate, and starts fighting. So only that simple rule, when generalized, brought us to the, to the state that we wanted. So to give a small example, it gives something like that. It's, it's, it's extremely messy. Uh, there's a bunch of guys uh, fighting, uh, guys and girls fighting left and right on the battlefield. And, but find, finding those, those small rules was really one of the challenging parts uh, because, uh, because of uh, the, the intricacies and the interdependence on, of all of them. So it's fine, we have those soldiers, they go to the battle, they start fighting, but we still needed to be able to generate those inputs. So Frédéric mentioned at the beginning that we use the same character pipeline for every single uh, of our actors, and it's the same thing for the small soldiers. So this is really great for animators. They can take the, the, play, the, 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 the small soldier and start using with them. But it's not really interesting for the player, or maybe it's DLC character announced. <laughs> And this is really a, a great tool for, for animators because they don't rely on setups from the AI programmers or uh, AI designers to test something. They can build the AI, the, the, the animation, they can look uh, and control the movement, see what's happening. So they, it made them uh, extremely independent uh, from us. Not that they don't like to talk to us, but. Uh, so the way that we use to generate those inputs is that we have an implementation of our behavior trees uh, inside the simulation. It's not extremely complex, but it does a good job. So you can see actually that the behavior trees that we have right now in the game are extremely simple. It's different rhythms of attack depending on the distance of the, of the target. But what's interesting is that, so we developed the tools that enable uh, designers to actually debug what was happening and, and, the, uh, and, and see and control the rhythm and the difficulty. And this can also be applied to any other actor. This is one of the other actors that we have in the game that uses the deterministic system. Uh, we call them captains. The, the trees became, started to be a bit more complex, uh, but it, it's still not like our, our bigger fighters. It's gonna come later, but uh, it's, it started to prove interesting. So our behavior trees by themselves are nodes. Uh, they're the ones that are actually generating the inputs. When it runs, really the, the output of those nodes is it creates a structure that are the inputs. The, uh, are you, is the character attacking? Is he moving? Is he dodging? And the conditions that the designers can put in place and hooks that enable the actors to, uh, to, to influence the environment. They're basically events. So our experience of using behavior trees inside the simulation 
was a mixed one, in the sense that it was extremely powerful for prototyping. Uh, designers could come with, uh, with quick ways of testing gameplay, see what was working, but we ended up often to, once that system was validated on a gameplay level, we needed to extract those functionalities and then implement them as services. So we had a, we had a lot of uh, analyzing what we wanted to do, strip them out, so it was a really good way to iterate quickly but CPU-wise, it was costing uh, too much. So uh, we needed to uh, extract the, the logic of those and put them in separated nodes. So you saw the actors, we have a, a living battlefield, but then on the other part, there's still heroes that needed to fight. So that's Fred's part. <laughs> Thank you, Xavier. Um, so, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? No? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay? Yeah, good. Uh, so yes, uh, we have, uh, with um, the deterministic AI, we have um, a, a battlefield with a lot of character inside it. We, you are able to, to go and play with this system, but we wanted to also bring uh, challenges to the player. Uh, it's a, it, meant, it was meant to be a, a PvP uh, uh, game. It was meant to have a PvP experience inside it. So we needed ways to control as well the heroes, the kind of characters the, the player is able to, to play. So um, uh, we, uh, we try to uh, create a system to, to handle this kind of, uh, of, of, of challenge. So why do we need another uh, AI system for it? First of all, uh, we have now flows in the map for the deterministic AI system, but if the player go out of it, uh, we, are, we can't do anything. So we needed to have a way to be able to chase the player everywhere in the map. Also, we want to have this cool moment, like you can see in the picture, where you grab the player on your shoulder and you throw him into spikes. So we needed to have uh, a more, um, uh, bit, a better understanding of what is your environment, what, are, what, what do you have around your hero. Uh, we need, did also a uh, better reactivity, uh, 300 uh, milliseconds to update your AI. It's, uh, it's a bit slow, and if your player is just in front of you and you have to react to it, it's, uh, it can be problematic. And one important aspect is that we wanted the AI to control the same kind of character. We didn't want it to add, uh, because it's a, a bot, uh, to add uh, 10,000 HP so that the player had to just attack him all over again to be able to kill him. So we needed to uh, base the difficulty on the skill and not on the statistic of the character. So if we look back to how do we control the character. Uh, the player, for the player, we get the pad, we generate input, send them into the simulation. So for the AI, so for the replicated AI system, for the bots, uh, we do, uh, the AI will generate input. So it will generate the input on one machine and send them over the network. So here we have a, an interesting system. It's um, since we are um, uh, working with a, a deterministic simulation, so what does it give us? Basically, it gives us uh, that we don't need to uh, predict uh, the state of the replicated characters as at, uh, uh, of the other players, for example, because the simulation does it for us. Uh, in fact, in the simulation, if you look at the current state, you have, in fact, the latest updated version of your character. And if you receive an input and a rewind happen, it will be updated and, and you will be fine. So, of course, uh, what happen if you have a rewind. The, world, the state of the world can change. So we discussed with the designer and we decided that we didn't want to consider the rewinds because most of the time a rewind happens, but it can be on another place on the battlefield. It doesn't really uh, necessarily affect the fights that you are currently doing. And, but if it happens that it affects the fights, the fights that you are currently doing, um, we, the only thing that you have to do is just check your, the current world state and change the decision of the AI. So for a certain amount of time, uh, when you fight against someone who is controlled by another machine, you can take wrong decisions. But we decided that it was okay because uh, as soon as you will receive the, the, the real state where you are, we will just update and take new decisions for the AI. So, and also one really important aspect is that since we are updated outside of the simulation, we are updated only once per frame. We don't, if a rewind happens, it doesn't affect the, the replicated AI system. So we have more CPU than the sims. 
Um, so for this system, we built um, uh, a lot of uh, elements. Uh, first one is the team strategy that will uh, analyze the battlefield and try to uh, assign tasks to, uh, to the characters to, to spread them uh, and try to win the game. Then each actor will have to um, uh, try to accomplish this task. And you have a lot of uh, services uh, to fight, to navigate, and kind of stuff. But in the end, what we want is to generate inputs for Katana to control the character. So in this talk, we will mainly focus on the fight service and the inputs, um, because that's an, uh, really a specific aspect of Forerunner. Maybe uh, uh, next year, uh, our colleague will uh, tr want to uh, uh, give you more information about the, uh, the other systems. So if we look at uh, Katana, so the way we control the characters, um, basically, it's a state machine. So if we want to control the character, what we want really is to control what happened into the state machine. What are, uh, what are the state, uh, what are the transitions that we do uh, in this, uh, in the, uh, what, what is the execution of your state machine? But the main issue we had is that we have 12 different characters. Uh, all 12 characters have a unique state machine uh, that uh, defines their gameplay. And also, this, um, this data was, um, uh, uh, was edited by designers. So they were able to submit and make changes every day. So it was really problematic for the AI to be uh, always up to date. So we decided to automatically extract information from this data. So we have two aspects that we uh, extract automatically. Uh, the first one is standard information. So what kind of uh, attack are you able to do? Uh, are you able to charge your attacks? Uh, can you faint your attack? Uh, what are the ranges, the timings, and uh, do you have special properties? Like, for example, as you can see on, on the pictures, uh, you have on the left an assassin, which uh, doesn't have uh, some defense when he is idle. And on the right, you have a tank that has some defense when he is idle. So to be able to extract this kind of uh, information, uh, we discussed with the character designers, and we were able to define standards. Uh, and so it means that they, they built all the characters, all this uh, standard information in the characters uh, with the same kind of patterns. So the algorithm was were able to uh, extract and find, locate these patterns inside the state machine and extract the information for the AI. But you have always combos and unique abilities, unique actions uh, that uh, define and give the flavor to your character. So you can see that, for example, we have a, 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 an ability which looks like this. Uh, the content is not really important, it's like more the, the structure. And what we want for, for the bot is to go to this state. This state represents, for example, the end of the attack. But how can we do that? Basically, what we want is to be able to extract the pass into the state machine. So we go into the branching between the states, we, go, we look at the condition, and we try to extract what uh, kind of inputs, what are the elements that will allow the character to uh, fulfill the condition and thus uh, 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 trigger the branching. So we do that for all the states until we go to the root of the ability. So to be able to do that, uh, it was uh, in fact pretty simple. We needed to find a way to give information to the algorithm to say, I want to reach this specific state. So in fact, it's uh, some data that the character designer uh, will have to put directly inside the data. And, uh, and that's it. We are able to, to locate them. And in fact, since they know their characters, they are, they are able to define, OK, this is, a kind of, this is a special ability of my character. And uh, I want to be sure that the AI is uh, able to do it. So with that, we have all the knowledge of our character. We know uh, how to control it, but uh, we have to get this information and bring it to the AI. So we decided to create simple elements that, will, uh, that we call fight actions that uh, are able to perform one specific action. So for example, uh, we have a, a fight action for the block, one for the attack, the dodge, ward breaks, uh, and stuff like that. And we have also one that is able to play an uh, input pass, so the pass that we have extracted uh, with the algorithm. Uh, one important aspect of it is that 
uh, all these blocks, all these fight actions are character agnostic. There is no code that says, uh, for the Viking assassin, uh, in this specific condition, you have to do this kind of, uh, of stuff. Um, so they only use the, uh, the auto-extracted data. It's way easier, way easier to debug. Uh, it was really a, really a good thing. So if we take a look at one example, um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, just look at the, uh, uh, a block of the attack. So on the left, you have a player. He will attack the, uh, the bot, and the bot will try to defend himself. So it's pretty simple, but how do we do that uh, in the game? So first of all, we need to be able uh, to detect that the bot is uh, attacked by the player. Then at runtime, we go inside the katana uh, graph of the player, and we're able to detect that, OK, he's attacking, and we know when will be the hit time. After that, we go inside the extracted information for the bot, and we get the defense duration of this character and the delay to trigger to activate uh, this uh, defense when we send the input. And the only remaining part is just to be sure that we will have some defense when the hit occurs so that we can block the attack. So we, we do that for all these kind of actions. Most of them are really pretty simple, but we are able to, uh, to combine them. Um, but yeah, we wanted, uh, so now we are able to do all the small elements, uh, but we have two, need, two needs in our game. First of all is PvP. Uh, in PvP, we want to replace players. We want to have uh, unpredictable fighters that when a player will face an opponent, he will not uh, know or if we will not recognize pattern in it. But in PvE, it's different. We wanted to be able to teach the game. We wanted to, the, 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 to create uh, some elements that, uh, that will um, help the player learn the mechanics and try different things and try to find what is the best option against uh, special uh, abilities and stuff like that. So these kind of characters are more pattern-based. And we also had a uh, few bosses in the game uh, with multiple stages and stuff like that. So we decided to, um, uh, yeah, our solution to create this kind of factor was to create a kind of database of all the moves, all the, the actions the, the bot will be able to perform. So if we look at the editor, as you can see, it, it looks like Katana, but it's another one. Uh, we were able to reuse a lot of, uh, of elements. That's why it looks uh, almost the same. But so we have three main elements. On the right, uh, it's what we call the action graph. So we put all the, the fight action blocks uh, together. We are able to create branching between them, set up conditions that uh, allow to, trigger, to um, activate this branching. Uh, on the left, you have the decision tree part. Uh, it's where you will uh, create a tree structure that will contain all the action graph. So all the leaf uh, of the, the, the tree contain an action graph and uh, uh, it, in fact is a, a, an action that you are able to perform. And we have conditions, filters, cooldown that allow you to define what branches of your tree are available uh, at a specific moment. So how does it look uh, at runtime? Uh, basically, we do a query inside this database every frame, which can be uh, problematic. So we can optimize. We, we did, uh, we did uh, some stuff to be able to be sure that it's not a, a big deal. The first, the first thing is that we pre-compute everything. We notice that most of the conditions are duplicated. So instead of computing your information into your condition, what, you, what we did is that we compute the information before, and in the condition, you have only to ju just check a value. It's really, really, uh, really easy. After that, since we use a tree structure, uh, if the designer organizes well the, the condition and the branches, uh, we are able to have a, a, a good early out. And also, we are able to do partial queries. Basically, when the bot is fighting, when he's performing a specific action, uh, he's, performing a, uh, he's doing an action graph. So we, have, uh, we define a priority for it, and we can trim and remove uh, in the query all the elements that are less important uh, in the tree. So in fact, most of the time, you just uh, look at uh, a few parts, a really, a really small amount of branches in your tree. So if we take a look 
at one example. Uh, so on the left, you can see the bot editor uh, uh, in run at runtime. And on the right, you have the player uh, in blue and the bot in, uh, in orange. And um, the, the bot will try to defend himself and attack. And you will be, you can see the, on the bottom, the condition, uh, they are highlighted in blue, in uh, green and red when the condition are met or not. So it was really, um, really powerful to help the designer understand what is happening. So he's doing a pretty good job. But, so, Right now, we have uh, the designer were able to create all these fighters, but how can we, um, but we have to use them in PvP. So if we let, take a look at one simple example, uh, we have six players, um, the matchmaking, um, they want to play a game where you have two teams, two teams of four players. The matchmaking will uh, balance all the players. So you know that your team are balanced, but you have one missing guy in each team. So you need to add a bot uh, in each team. Um, but what kind of bot do you choose? Uh, if you, you, you don't want to introduce an advantage to one team by choosing a fighter which is way too, um, too hard uh, and, and uh, select two bots that, are, uh, that don't have the same uh, uh, difficulty. And in fact, in the game, we created three difficulty levels uh, for, uh, from uh, rank one to rank three. So how can you be sure that your difficulty looks something like this? Uh, all the rank one are, uh, uh, are at the same level, approximately, and they are uh, less uh, um, hard than the, the rank two, and uh, the rank three are better than everywhere than everyone else. How can you guarantee that you have your difficulty is uh, uh, almost uh, homogeneous. Uh, in fact, we ended up uh, wanting to validate the, the, the EI. But we have so two, uh, 12 characters, sorry. We have three difficulty levels. Uh, it means that we have too many matchups that we want to test. And most of the time, when uh, we had meetings with uh, designers, testers, directors, and um, we were fighting against a specific bot, and everyone was saying, oh yeah, I feel this guy is easy, I feel he's hard, but it was, not, it was only feeling, not science. So we decided to uh, implement uh, automatic duels between uh, the bots, and we track the result. So it's pretty simple. You set up an arena. You put uh, two fighters uh, against each other. And as soon as there is one dead, you, you have your result. So the usage was uh, 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 really, uh, really cool. We were able to uh, play more than 250 duels each night for, uh, on one PC. And the goal was to reach um, a predefined uh, win ratio because uh, an assassin, for example, uh, can uh, should win more easily um, against a tank. So you don't uh, you don't need to aim to a 50% uh, ratio for all your characters. But it's not a silver bullet because if you have two bots that are broken, the result doesn't make any sense. You need to be sure that you have one bot at least that represents exactly the level of difficulty that you, yes, that you want for a specific rank. And after that, you are able to compare it with others and, and so on. So it's, it's only mainly to detect high level anomalies, but uh, we were able to, to use it uh, uh, in, the, in that way. So that's it for the replicated AI. Uh, we'll try to share a few takeaways uh, about all this, this process. So we use the input-driven approach. Uh, was it worth it? Uh, basically, yes. Uh, in fact, we were able to share all the player uh, improvements and testing. So we have, uh, uh, in, on For Honor, a team of testers that is fully dedicated to test the player, uh, to, to test the characters. And they, they, they do that by just playing with the characters. And on the AI side, we were sure that the characters are uh, well uh, tested and well, uh, well uh, uh, and in, in fact, if we send an input to the character, it will do exactly uh, what we wanted him to do. So uh, mostly, the, when we had a bug, that when a bot wasn't able to perform something, it was on the AI side that the input that was sent was not the good one. 
Also, uh, as Xavier mentioned, it allows the user, the animators, the designers, to prototype really easily. They were able to spawn an elephant, for example, and just play with him uh, with the pad. So it was uh, uh, no need of any programmer for that, uh, which is a, a really good thing because programmers can be a bottleneck sometimes. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, also, it was really lightweight for the networking. And one interesting thing is that since um, we use the same pipeline, the AI can't cheat. It's not possible. The AI can only send input, like the player. And so if the player can do something, the AI can do it. And it's in the opposite, if the player can't do something, the AI can't do it. So for a competitive, uh, for a multiplayer game, it's important so that you know that when uh, the, uh, you, do, you uh, are in PvP, uh, you, you, uh, your AI can't, can't cheat, it's, it's important. Uh, so we used also a lot of data-driven, as, uh, as we uh, explained. Uh, the behavior trees on the left, uh, on the top right, you have Katana, on the bottom right, uh, you have uh, the, the bot editor. Was it really worth it? Uh, yes. Uh, basically, the designers were really um, uh, autonomous. They were uh, the owner of the feature, of the fighters, of the characters, of anything. Uh, it was really, really important for us. And, but also, uh, and we were able to create a lot of characters. We have so 12 characters at launch uh, in the game. We have, uh, I think, an, uh, 100 of uh, different kind of fighters, uh, of AI fighters that can co uh, take control of these characters. Um, but it's really important to, uh, to give them great tools. You, you can't just give them, like, uh, uh, as Xavier mentioned, a list of properties to set, and, and that's it. You need to uh, be able to give them good visualization. You need to give them uh, debug tools, a way to understand what's happening, so that they are able to isolate when they have uh, problems and bugs, and they are able to isolate, understand what is happening, and after that, they come to see you, and that's because maybe there is a bug inside it. And then the other side, uh, working with the simulation, I mean, it's been five years uh, in total and for honor. What was it? Was it a good idea? Did it work? And it's been a daunting task. Uh, we learned a lot, but the advantages of having something that, uh, that you don't need to, to, to think, basically, programmers that are working in the simulation, they don't need to care about the fact that they're on a, on a network or not. Uh, the simulation is always right. It's going to take care of what's happening. If, it, if a programmer was working in the constraints of the simulation in a deter deterministic fashion, well, uh, he, it was already working online. So that was really a great, a great thing. We didn't need to be uh, taking into account, uh, is, is it the real position? Uh, is, it, uh, is it an entity that's owned by my system, by my, by my session, or is it somebody else handling with replicas? It's something that we didn't need to, to look into, so that was really great. Uh, of course, that we need to, you need to take uh, into account that you need to work in the, in the deter with deterministic code. So as it, it happened a lot, uh, storing something outside of the history buffers that we showed in the beginning, well, it caused it caused desyncs. So obviously, uh, once once everybody knew the framework uh, in, in which we were working, it worked it worked pretty well. And I mean, it's the whole talk why we're here. Two AI systems. Uh, was it a good thing? Was it a bad thing? And for us, really, when we think about it, it's it. it those systems did what we wanted. Uh, from the beginning, it's really what, are, what were the tools that we needed to build those systems, what's the behavior that we wanted, and by having the approach of always centering our design decisions, our technical decisions on the player, well, it enabled us to come to that, to that point, and in the end, yes, we think, we, think we, we made the right calls. Uh, it, I mean, uh, it's, it's doing a, a, a great job. Every system, both systems are different. However, having those two systems, it's not an LOD, so like, uh, soldiers that are going in a NAF flow cannot become a bot and start going somewhere else, so there's definitely some limitations. It's some things that we can think about evolving, uh, and it's a constraint that was definitely something to, to, uh, to look into in, throughout uh, all the production. So that covers it, that covers it all. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think we have some time for questions. And <laughs> And, and also one point, uh, uh, just after the, the, this presentation, there's an awesome presentation about modifiers in Foreigner that's done by one of our colleagues, Aurélie Le Chevalier. So, yes, good.
So I don't know if there's any questions. Do we have time? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yes, it's not directly AI related, but um, in the replicated AI, yes. how do you decide, in a peer-to-peer -peer based game, how do you decide who simulates the replicated AI? Uh, the way that it works is that there is there's a peer that's uh, owner of one of, of that AI. Uh, so uh, there is a, it, it can be one machine or multiple machines that, that can send uh, those inputs. The, the way that we decide, it's uh, since, since in the, the, the goal of the bots when they're fighting is really to replace a player. Uh, we, there, is no, there is no specific metric about choosing who's going to be the, 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 the owner of that bot. Uh, I mean, it's going to be, it's, it's, there's definitely going to be a, a difference for, player, for players that are fighting against that bot. I mean, he's going to have the same lag as uh, the host, uh, as the owner of that, uh, of, of that, of that peer. But uh, it, it's, it's the same thing as the player against who you're fighting. So a, a good choice, I would say, was probably, would probably to take uh, the, uh, choose the teams. So like basically, if, if, if uh, on my machine I'm hosting, um, I'm handling a bot that's on my, on my side, I won't be fighting him, I won't get any advantage, I won't get zero, zero lag, zero ping. Uh, well, so by using that rule, it's a good way to mitigate that issue. Interesting. Thank you. No problem. Hello. Uh, so you mentioned specifically about AI, but I wanted to know this for the player versus player. You also only send the inputs, or if you also send some uh, state properties on the players no. or health no. or anything? No, the no, same no. thing, yeah. It's the same thing, uh, or, or, or only inputs, yeah. Okay. yeah. Only the inputs, and everybody gets to the same conclusion, and so, uh, so, so yeah. Uh, as soon as you play on your machine, you take the ex the, 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 your decisions instantaneously, so it's deterministic. and. Uh, and those inputs, when they're received on the other side, the other machine really syncs up and goes to the same point. But it, it's the only uh, information that we send. So it's closer to a, a lockstep system than yes. to a yeah. proper report. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. Sure. Um, two questions. Would you redo uh, the matches between the bots, like if you did balance changes for the heroes? Um, and then also, did you only do that with one map, or did you do that with multiple kinds of maps? Uh, can you just repeat? I just, I didn't understand. Oh, sorry. Uh, the bot versus bot matches, if you rebalance the champions to like maybe affect their range or something like that, yeah. would you rerun the rematches between all the bots to get a new ranking? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah of course. Uh, at, um, currently, we are doing uh, iterations and patches and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, if we, can, we can use the same system to, to validate. And we can, if we need, if uh, uh, really, uh, um, uh, if we change something really important on, on one character, we, we can update the AI accordingly to be sure that we uh, maintain the same difficulty, yes. Gotcha. Yeah. And then for the bot for versus bot matches, were you doing that uh, just on one map or all the maps? Uh, currently, we use it on one map, but uh, we could use it in any map here. Uh, Basically, we, we have one map, uh, what, uh, which was uh, the, the first map that was created, and we use it all the time. So we did the test in this one. Um, and I think we have all the kind of situations that we want in this map, like uh, uh, drops, so you can just throw someone uh, on a, from a bridge. Uh, we have uh, spikes and stuff like that. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so are there properties to the melee combat that make the uh, deterministic and uh, input-driven system that you guys went for more useful as compared to like other game types, like a shooter or RTS or something like that? It's a, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, on, on SC, on our side, well, it worked really well. We, what we wanted was really to get feedbacks as quick as possible because uh, the, uh, uh, your enemy is really in front of your face. So uh, we wanted to, to have the link between those two peers as, as short as possible. So that's why we went into, into that uh, direction. Um, if your enemies are further away, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure you need such a big system because it, it, it has a cost. Like every single of our actors in the world, even somebody that's really far away, well, we, if there's a lag, if, if we get an input that's further away in time, we re-simulate re that actor. So it has a, a toll on CPU. So I, I don't think it's, definite, it's necessarily something I would be using on a, on a first person shooter, for example. Cool. Uh, I also had a second question. Uh, did you ever run into butterfly effects when like replaying stuff or um, were there every like really long latency that like you wouldn't be able to replay? Definitely at the beginning of the game it was starting that the, something that happened we call them like the, the vortex of death uh, because if, if, if it takes too much time then your next input is going to take more time then the other resimulates longer and then over and over uh, so what we do is like we always ensure that uh, 
or we have enough time to, to catch up. Uh, luckily, we didn't have that issue, but uh, it's definitely something that can happen if you have something that's applied on, for example, all the actors in the world, and if you do this and you need to re-simulate a lot of, uh, of, uh, of simulation steps, it can definitely happen. Uh, what we probably do is that we, we our system is, go if somebody is lagging too much, he's gonna get kicked out before things get too bad. So. Cool, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about your bot on bot matches. Mm -hmm. um, don't you get like an, like a skewed uh, statistic if like a certain type of AI is like just because of the balancing is just by design more effective against another type? Like how do you like compensate for that? I'm just curious like about the metrics. Like won't that like skew them somehow? Uh, it's I think it's we, um, we guarantee that at least one character is uh, tweaked and tested uh, by a human so that um, in fact, the other one will only be tested against this one. Of course, we test all the characters uh, with the testers, but we guarantee that some characters are really, really uh, heavily uh, tested so that we are sure that it represents exactly what the level of difficulty that we want. So all characters are supposed to be equally effective against all other characters in that case? Not equally, but um, it, that's why uh, if you have an assassin, for example, against a tank, it May, may have a better win ratio against this one, but we try to just be sure that it's homogeneous. We have, a, uh, we, we allow a certain margin, but uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my question is about the rules, uh, determining the rules, and I was wondering if the, what the process was to determine if a rule was a good one or a bad one, and if uh, there was some kind of formula you were using to judge the fitness of a certain rule, and if that could possibly be automated. For, for the rules that govern the, the, the fighters? Yes, so you were talking about how you set a, a rule and then it wasn't quite right, and then you'd go and change. I was wondering about that process. Yeah, uh, it, it was a lot of, uh, so our engine, since it's a simulation-based engine, we can speed up the process a lot. So uh -huh. there, there were a lot of times where we were able to, so let's try those values, let's see what happened, simulate it, and some of our designers, people were wondering, what the hell are you doing? It's been 10 minutes you're watching the game play on fast forward, uh, while well, they were <laughs> validating the balance and what are the impacts of what they're doing. So we have a way of uh, really increasing really, really fast. So that's one of the way. Uh, other way, it's a lot of debug display tools, uh, visualizing what's happening with the, with the different forces, the different uh, algorithms that you're putting in place. And, uh, and yeah, that's most of it. All right, thanks. Um, I was curious on the bot on bot matches, if you had completely deterministic AI, how the matches just didn't turn out exactly the same every single time. Uh, no, the bots are not deterministic. Uh, okay. The AI of the bot uh, uh, is not deterministic. It's computed only on one machine, and that's why we, uh, we replicate the stuff. So but but, it's, but it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, our game, it's deterministic, but they're still random. Like, uh, every, what, the way that it works is that every single agent has its seed, its ra own random, uh, random generator that's uh, al uh, aligned to the, the current simulation step, uh, the agent seed, and then we're sure that in, in the simulation step, we can use Random, uh, that random generator and have uh, varying results. So even if, but de definitely if, if we use the same thing and we send the same inputs, you're gonna get the, get the exact same result, uh, abs absolutely. Uh, so uh, changing the seed of the session, stuff like that, is ways that we use to, to have a var variance so that you're not doing exactly the same thing. Okay, yeah, and, uh, and yes, yeah, fact, in fact, it's if you send the same inputs, but as, because the, uh, for the bots, the system that generates the input is not deterministic, you can just, have different matches every time, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Hello, uh, my question is about what happens when you, when you receive an update and you re-simulate. Do you have a way to figure out which entities to re-simulate, or do you just go to you know, re-simulate everything? Right now we re-simulate everything, uh, like when the, the, the naive approach maybe, uh, and so, yeah, so we redo everything. What we do is that when we see that there is a change that affected an object, uh, so we have that other pattern that we call the observer pattern that's responsible of all the uh, visual effects, uh, for example, uh, blood splatters, effects, sounds, so that when it sees that an, an object state has changed, well, it cancels the, the effects that were linked to that, to that object, and so, so that we're, we come in sync. Uh, but yeah, so we, 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 we're not separating. It's, it, it's for four honors, too. <laughs> Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, so, you're, so the game is available for different platforms, right? Uh, Xbox, 
PlayStation, yes. Windows, yeah. can, can you play across those? Um, no. No, we okay. can't. Uh, well, the deterministic engine is one of the problems, uh, so you cannot, uh, you, you cannot do that. And, and but but uh, we have a meta game uh, yeah. where you control territories and stuff like that. Uh, this is cr uh, uh, the same across all the platforms, but uh, the game, no, you can't play uh, on PS4 against uh, someone on Xbox One. No, it's because not the same. determinism. Yeah. But even for uh, Windows versus Windows, I would think determinism would be a problem if you're if you're platform dependent. Yeah. Well, we. We're not that platform dependent in the sense that uh, we did add some issues, for example, at the beginning with Intel versus AMD CPUs. Uh, we're not always getting the exact same results, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that uh, I personally didn't do it, but uh, our uh, engine, uh, engineers uh, figured a way to, to fix that. But we, so we probably would be able to fix it for multi-platform, uh, inter-platform consoles, but it's, it's not part of, uh, of any plan. Uh, okay. It seems that we don't have enough yes. time for more questions, but we can uh, meet uh, in the wrap room if yep. you want after that. So. Thank you very much again. Thank you.